Can you make your PMC reload faster simply by changing a keybind? Does merely having the EOTech HHS-1 optic mounted on your gun make it less accurate? Is it true that you can survive a direct headshot from rifle caliber rounds without a helmet? The answer to all of these questions coming up on today's episode of Science or Sus. Lay down your weapons and give up! In Tarkov's not-too-distant past, BSG did an overhaul to the keybind system that included a few important changes many of us are both still getting used to and in some ways don't fully understand. If you look in the keybind section of the game settings, we can see there is a drop-down associated with each keybind that allows us to choose whether or not we want the action to be triggered upon pressing, releasing, upon continuously holding, or double-tapping that key. Now, unlike most PC FPS games in history where simply pressing R initiates a reload, the setting to reload your gun in Tarkov defaults to releasing the R button. And what's more is that Tarkov also has another feature that's unique to the genre, and that's the ability to initiate what the game refers to as an emergency weapon reload, a faster mag swap at the cost of dropping the prior mag onto the ground. So you might be asking yourself, why is it that the normal reload is set to be on the release of the R button rather than the press of the R button? Well, that's because there's also another even less used feature in Tarkov that allows you to hold down the reload button to open a little context menu so you can choose which mag you want to load without needing to open your inventory and click and drag mags around. Now, I personally never do this because the default reloading behavior pretty much always prioritizes the mag with the most number of rounds in it, which is what I'm going to want most of the time anyway. Nevertheless, the feature exists and some people like it. And what comes along with this are a few subtle side effects that, again, most people aren't aware of. As a developer, as soon as you introduce the ability to bind the same key to two different actions, with action A being triggered with a single tap of that button, and action B being triggered by a double tap, you now have to deal with the fact that when the player presses the key the first time, you can't really be sure if they want to do action A, or if the key press is simply the first of two presses to initiate action B. If this combination of features is to work properly, as soon as you bind the same key to different actions where one is a double tap, the game is basically required to wait some amount of time before triggering the single tap action just in case you intended to press it again. Now, The only way the game can really know if you don't intend to double tap is by waiting to see if you double tap, which kind of sucks, doesn't it? This is where this little slider comes in, the double click timeout. By default, this setting is set to the minimum of 0.3 seconds, which should ultimately mean that the default reloading keybind combination adds effectively a third of a second to every normal reload that you do. Let's compare different types of reloads and different combinations of keybinds. Now obviously different guns and skills and mods are going to vary the results further, but here's at least a baseline to compare for the average player. Now obviously the testing criteria is pretty arbitrary here, but as long as we're consistent with how we do the tests, then it should be fine to demonstrate the relative reload times. Each example starts a frame counter on the exact frame that my finger is done pressing each keybind and stops on the first frame that I'm able to shoot the gun again after reloading. To start, let's look at the Vepr 136 and initiate a normal reload with the default keybinds. Now let's see how much faster the reload is when we double tap the reload button. Now let's change the emergency reload button to the double tap of a totally different key other than the default of R, and then initiate a normal reload pressing R, and because we no longer have anything bound to the double click of this key, that means the game shouldn't have to wait for the double click timeout. Finally, just to ensure that we fully understand what's going on here, let's max out the double click timeout to one second and see if what we see is what we'd expect. So, the 136 took 2.7 seconds to reload normally, and we were able to shave off just under half a second by doing an emergency reload. Now, after removing the double-click keybind from the R key, the duration of a normal reload process was reduced by 0.3 seconds, exactly what we'd expect given the default double-click timeout of the same time. 
Now, after increasing the timeout to one second while having the other binds set to their defaults, we again see what we would expect. The normal reload being 0.7 seconds slower than the default and a full one second slower than when we unbind double clicking R. Let's take a look at a couple more weapon systems to double check our findings. First, the MP7 gave us basically the same results that we saw from the Vepr, although the time saved by emergency reloading with the MP7 was almost twice as much as with the 136. Now finally, let's look at the SKS, which is actually one of a small handful of unique cases because this weapon system doesn't support the ability to do an emergency reload. Now everything we see here tracks with what we'd expect except for the emergency reload, which still somehow managed to be slightly faster than a normal reload despite the fact that there is no emergency reload on the SKS at all. So what gives? Now I think the best explanation here that matches perfectly with what we see is that when you press R the first time, the game has to wait 3 tenths of a second for that double click timeout before starting the reload. But now imagine that it takes about a tenth of a second between the first and second clicks of a double click on the keyboard. Now as soon as you've double clicked, the game no longer has to wait to decide what you want to do. But in this case on the SKS there is none. So it simply does a normal reload. Now it only took 0.1 seconds for the game to know for sure that you want it to reload rather than the 0.3 seconds normally required. So that would explain why doing an emergency reload on a gun that doesn't even support that behavior was still, at least in my case, 0.2 seconds faster than the default. Now overall, whether or not you'd wanna mess with the keybinds that you've been familiar with for however long you've been playing, that's up to you. In this case, it does appear that changing your keybind for the quick reload to something other than double tapping your normal reload keybind button will actually speed up the normal reload time of most guns. So this one is science. What? Alrighty then, on to the next claim, that there's something about the EOTech holographic hybrid sight, or the HHS, that gives you more recoil than other optics. Now I did a decent amount of testing and wanting it out of the way that I don't fully understand everything I'm seeing with all of the results. Partly because there's so many unknown unknowns involved in these sorts of mechanics and partly because, as is too often the case, different people mean different things while using the same language and it's never really clear what anybody means. An example is when people are talking about recoil, some of them refer to it as camera recoil, weapon recoil, character recoil. I'm not really sure if people are talking about the amount that the gun moves around in your PMC's hands while shooting, or if they're talking about the amount that the camera or field of view shifts while you're shooting. Different types of optics potentially display the reticle in different ways. Some sit more forward, more backward, more higher or lower relative to the board axis of the gun. FOV is an aspect that can potentially affect the perceived recoil in ways that we might not expect because of perspective and also in ways that we might not expect because of bugs or inconsistencies. I'm not sure we really understand how weight affects the way the guns handle and how the different combinations of things like weight, center of mass, and ergonomics and all of the different weapon systems change what it is that we actually see. Why is it that different variable scopes that say they're 1x have different perceived levels of zoom even on the same 1x setting? And how is it that we're supposed to interpret comparisons between two different mags from the same gun when their spray patterns are largely governed by randomness? There's honestly enough here to talk about for hours, and we don't have hours. I've changed my mind about half a dozen times, and right now I have no f***ing idea what to think. There's a ton of times where it seems totally obvious to me that the HHS in its unmagnified state has a ton more recoil. Here are a couple of examples where you can see two sets of shots fired with the same gun, synced and overlaid one with the HHS and the other with a different holographic site. Now it desaturated the picture on the non-HHS site video, so if you look at the reticle in red, that is the HHS. The first thing you'll notice is that the reticle circle clearly moves a ton more on the HHS than the alternatives, which at first blush seems pretty clear that indicates more recoil. Now this is also slightly supported by the fact that the laser appears to also move more on the shot on the HHS, indicating more muzzle rise. Then again, when looking at the other potential indications, although it's kind of hard to see unless you do some editing magic, you'll have to take my word for it, but the body of the gun and the hands controlling it appear to move a bit less on the shot with the HHS, perhaps indicating more control over the gun. Then I started to consider how the reticles on these different hollow sites are rendered and how that might affect the perspective of how much the different reticles are actually moving. 
Who knows if the inconsistencies are because they actually painstakingly, realistically modeled the differences in how these hollow reticles are projected on the various windows, as would be the case in real life, or because they were implemented by different people at different times in the dev cycle and it's just inconsistency. Well, then I tried to control for the differences in distance between where the player's camera sits relative to where the sight is mounted on the gun and how that might make these side-by-side -side comparisons misleading. And we don't have control over where the sights are mounted on the rails, but we do have a few options with some mods on the AK weapon systems that are close enough. Let's compare the same holographic sight mounted on the top rail of the dust cover versus more forward on the handguard. This might give us some insight into how the perceived recoil from the movement of the reticle might be affected by where the sight actually sits on the gun. Once again, I'm kind of left at a loss. When we compare the visual recoil for the same sight mounted differently on the same gun, we can see the smaller, more distant reticle appears to move more, which is what we would expect if you take the moment to consider how the visual angles and everything would work here. But then, of course, when you consider the fact that the reticle got smaller the further the holographic sight got away from your face, you realize that doesn't exactly match what we see in real life. Now let's compare the HHS and another hollow sight that are mounted only slightly differently from front to back, and let's see if we can see the same sort of relationship between how the reticles move. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell. Sometimes it seems like the red reticle on the HHS is bouncing around a lot more than the other, and sometimes it seems like the opposite is the case, which basically reminded me about my favorite factor here, RNG. The recoil of every shot is basically random and seemingly totally unique. Some shots seem to have much less felt recoil than others, with the recoil your PMC experiencing sometimes much more drastic in one direction or barely noticeable in another, so basically tells me I probably shouldn't be comparing single shots at all. It's at this point that I decided to compare spray patterns. The problem here is that there really isn't a ton of places in the game to accurately test this, because most services in the game are either not big enough to be able to contain the overly exaggerated recoil we see in the game on most weapon systems, not to mention being able to contain a healthy sample size worth of side-by-side -side spray patterns. Now, those of you who follow me on Twitter and came across the salty tweets I put out earlier today will have a bit more context as to why I was complaining. Now, it makes it worse that most of the materials in the game that you could be shooting, like a concrete wall, are implemented in such a way that makes visually comparing these things basically impossible as well. The bullet holes are basically client-side random images of varying sizes that are not always perfectly centered where you hit. Not only is it impractical to do testing like this on a remotely large enough scale to account for the randomness, it also just doesn't feel fair or accurate to try to do any sort of visual analysis to determine minor recoil differences from different pictures like this. And then, of course, I remembered all of the other factors I hadn't yet considered that I'm sure I would be informed about by an insightful and polite YouTube commenter like how the total weight of the gun or things like the center of mass differences between the guns and their different optic combinations might affect the way it handles, combined with ergonomics, blah, blah, blah. At this point, I don't know. I hate to not come to any conclusion on this, but I'm not going to not tell you about this rumor in my tests because of the stupid amount of time I spent trying to figure it all out. All I can say is, it might be broken. It might not be. Even if I came to a conclusion, they'd probably change something tomorrow that would make it irrelevant and break the whole goddamn thing, so why didn't it? Alrighty then, on to the final claim. You can survive a headshot from a rifle without a helmet. Now, there's a lot wrapped up in this one too, but most folks in the community have the same handful of explanations. The first is usually attributed to scavs and is thought to be a bug where they just don't take any damage at all. People think they're invincible. Some people point to the fact that scavs have different health pools, how the more difficult level scavs that spawn in later in raids or, you know, bosses, guards, raiders, stuff like that, have more head HP than their normal counterparts, and that's the explanation for why they don't die when you shoot them in the head with a rifle. Now, some people claim that it's cheaters with god mode hacks, and while all of these explanations might account for some people's anecdotes, most of the stories that we have don't come with video evidence, so all we can do is take their word for it. In nearly all of the cases in which I've been presented video evidence and people want an explanation, the same few explanations always seem to be the most obvious and simple, so Occam's Razor tells me they're the most likely. The first is the most simple of all. You missed. Simple as that. 
Sometimes it can seem like your shots were accurate, but without the ability to watch a replay, you'll never know how good your judgment or your memory is. The second is something I've talked about countless times, height over bore. I'm going to use a clip from my good buddy Gummerack as an example here, as he had the same sort of questions about what happened here. The higher the sight is relative to the bore axis of the gun, the more significant the difference between your point of aim and point of impact is going to be between where you're standing and where your scope is zeroed to. Just because your reticle is on the target's head and you hit them doesn't mean you hit them in the head. Just because you see blood on their head or you see their head go back, it doesn't mean it's a headshot. The blood and character animations are not consistent or reliable. This explanation by itself accounts for damn near all of the complaints that people have about hitting headshots on non-helmet wearing targets and them not dying. Now what accounts for a healthy chunk of the remaining claims that I've been able to examine is one that's due to a fairly recent change to the ballistics of the game and some other balancing, and it has to do with bullets damage drop off over distance. Put simply, the longer your bullet travels, the less damage it's going to do. For the vast majority of the bullets and distances that you're going to have fights in, the damage drop off is irrelevant and if you hit your target in the head without head protection, they will die. There are a few cases that are not tremendously unlikely. Here I'm going to be testing 545x39 PPBS, aka Agolnik rounds, because they're a commonly used high pen meta ammo that has a base damage of 37. Now this is relevant because the default head damage for PMCs and scabs is 35. So what does that mean for us using this round? Well, I lined up my trusty test subjects spread out 25 meters apart, ranging from 50 to 175 meters, to see if we could find some sort of threshold for where this particular round would not have enough damage to be able to kill people in one shot. Oh shit. Yo, how much HP do you have? 30, 40, or so you have you have one HP in your head. We did a few more tests to try and hone in on where this one-shot headshot threshold was, and I came to the conclusion that it's somewhere in the realm of 90 to 100 meters. After that point, unless you get a lucky fragmentation or something like that, you're not going to be doing enough damage to one-shot headshot them. Now, the same logic can be applied to the different scavs with different health pools, all of the different bullets in the game that have varying levels of damage, and the different distances that you're going to be hitting your targets at. Lots of bullets in the game will be unable to one-shot headshot many characters at some distances, although, to be honest with you, it's probably pretty unlikely. The vast majority of rifle caliber rounds and distances that people are hitting headshots at should have enough damage. A few noteworthy examples of some more common rounds and ranges that will not have enough damage to one-shot headshot on armored targets can be seen on screen right now. The vast majority of the time, the explanation for why people aren't dying when you hit them in the head is that you didn't hit them in the head for one reason or another. Even though the most common explanations that people have tend to be wrong in my opinion, I think the test I did here demonstrates pretty clearly that this is absolutely science. <laughs> Once again, a big thank you to all of the people who jumped in to help test. And of course, I can't say thank you enough to all of my amazing supporters on Patreon. Your support really does mean the world to me and makes a difference. If you haven't already and think the entertaining educational content I put out is worth even a few dollars a month, please click the link in the description and become a patron. We'll see you guys next time.